Ruapehu has been struggling. The ski field operators, tens of millions in debt. Obviously the morale is uh, pretty low. We all sink or swim together and I'm hoping that we can all back our way through this. The company behind Lyft Operations is now set to go into liquidation. So, where did things go wrong? And what's next for the mountain? Ruapehu, like many ski fields, only pulls in meaningful income for four months of the year, a period that is becoming increasingly threatened by climate change. It also isn't near an international airport to attract tourists like its South Island competitors. Ski mountains are a tough business, and people have criticised the management of Ruapehu for years. But we're going to start our focus with the 2019 launch of the Skywalker. This was a big step for Mount Ruapehu, becoming a main attraction for year-round tourism. But with big ambitions comes big costs. Skywalker was going to cost $25 million to build, so Vruapehu Alpine Lifts took on significant investment, including $10 million from central government, nine and a half from local iwi, and a variety of small investments from local community. This investment has not paid off. By now, the Skywalker would need an annual ridership of over 300,000 people to start being a good return on investment, and they're not even close to those numbers. Then came COVID-19, which was an enormous hit to the region as a whole. In 2021, the Tongariro Crossing saw an 80% drop in tourism. So, emerging into 2022, they needed a strong season to balance the books, and nature didn't deliver. Mount Ruapehu's two main ski fields are still lying largely barren, awaiting a thorough snow dump before they can fully open. As of October 2022, an emergency meeting was called and the company was placed into voluntary administration under PwC. They realised that, you know, we're not going to be able to pay our bills. We'll get to a position where we are insolvent, if not already insolvent. So you bring in John Fisk and Richard Nacy of PwC to sort of find a path forward. I think the interesting thing here is, is that in most businesses that the likes of PwC would come in and, and sort of strip or, or save, there are just so many less moving parts and so many less stakeholders who expect different things. So who are the creditors at the end of 2022? At this stage, the most significant player is central government who had given another $5 million loan to keep the business afloat through COVID. Then there was also ANZ and the bondholders group. But you may have noticed that the pass holders are missing from that list. After all, since 1954, over 14,000 pass holders have put more than $45 million into the ski field. Well, in May of 2023, the RSSA, who represented around 6,000 of the pass holders, made an agreement with PwC to assign a proper value to each of these lifetime passes. Overnight, they became the most significant creditor, both in terms of financial value and voting numbers. Then there is the most important single creditor, the Department of Conservation. DOC hadn't loaned any money to Ruapehu, but they do manage the land the ski field sits on. Ruapehu has a leasing concession to the land that was first granted in 1953. But this means that if things all go wrong and the ski field has to be scrapped, it's DOC who's left holding the bag. And returning a ski field to nature isn't cheap. It is estimated that just removing the lifts will cost over $50 million and that the total cost of the restoration could be over $100 million. That puts DOC as the most significant single creditor. Between the debt to MBIE and the credit claim of DOC, the Crown have a huge say in the future of the ski field. So, what is the future of the mountain? On the 20th of June, the creditors had a meeting to decide who will own the ski field. I think the vote was always going to be complicated. The voting rights are based 75% off value of what is owed and 50% off numbers. So MB is one creditor, ANZ is one creditor, the Department of Conservation is one creditor. The life pass holders were 14,000 creditors. This meant that either party was able to block the proposal from the other side and neither option passed. The day after the vote, the company was officially liquidated, creating a lot more uncertainty about the future of the ski field. The most likely scenario is that the mountain is still sold to the government's preferred buyers. Pure Turao will take over the management of Turao ski field, and Whakapapa Holdings will manage Whakapapa. 
However, for either of these new companies to manage their ski fields, they will need Doc to provide them with the concessions to operate. And an essential part of this concessions process is consultation with local iwi, a group that feels largely overlooked by this whole process. So there are so many groups of mana whenua over the Tongariro National Park, and so it's pretty difficult to say conclusively that this is what they want as a collective, because I don't think you can accurately think of them as you know, one body. But they do want to be heard, they want to be brought to the table, and they don't want to be a box checking exercise. This liquidation and sales process began over eight months ago, but Kitty Allen only began emergency meetings with Iwi in the last few weeks. Iwi don't want to block the ski fields operation. Many of their communities rely on Ropehu for employment and enjoy the ski season. But they've made it clear that they won't let these new buyers sweep them aside in a rush to open the mountain. This has been one of the most captivating and complicated business failures in New Zealand's history. Mount Ropehu is a place of enormous cultural and economic significance, from being a major employer to a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And if the likely sale goes ahead, for the first time in its 70 year history, it'll be under for-profit ownership.